This video is the first in a two-part series that looks at how a free particle moves in the region outside an uncharged rotating black hole described by the Kerr metric. The first, uh, this first video derives the equations of the geodesics for the time t and azimuthal angle phi coordinates. It uses the Lagrangian method. Now we can find the equations of the geodesics of free particles in the Kerr geometry using the Euler-Lagrange equations. They'll be the focus of this in the next video. Now our aim is to find the form of the equations for the t dot r dot theta dot and phi dot coordinates. So we're describing this path in terms of the coordinates t, r, theta and phi. t will be scaled to be uh, ct um, and those coordinates will be parameterized in terms of an affine parameter lambda. Uh, for a particle with mass, that parameter lambda would be the proper time, but for a massless particle, we can't use proper time. So we use an, a generalized affine parameter lambda. And the situation is we're gonna have a rotating source mass. This oblates spheroidal shape, dilated bulging in the equatorial direction, so dilated away from the uh, axis of rotation in the equatorial plane, in the equatorial plane direction. And um, uh, as I said, it will be parameterized in terms of lambda. Um, tangent to these geodesics is the four velocity of the particle. And throughout these two videos, we'll work with the four velocity and the four momentum. Now, both the fall velocity and the fall momentum are tangent to the geodesics at all points. So the fall, fall momentum vector and the fall velocity vector are tangent. Um, in terms of the fall velocity, we have ct dot r dot theta dot phi dot is the coordinates. And the magnitude of this vector for a particle with mass uh, will be minus c squared now the magnitude is the four velocity vector dotted with itself the scalar or inner product of the vector gives us minus c squared and that'll be the total derivative dx mu of the coordinates with respect to the parameter lambda okay so x dot mu the dot will stand for dx mu d lambda so it's differentiating the coordinates with respect to lambda so each dot will be differentiating with respect to lambda. So two dots would be the second derivative with respect to lambda. Coming back to the four momentum of the particle, its magnitude, the four momentum vector, is tangent to the geodesics followed by the particle, the free particle. And that is equal to that magnitude of the four, four momentum vector with itself, the inner product, the scalar product, is p dot p will be minus m squared c squared um, the minus minus m squared c squared for the four momentum inner product and for the four velocity in product is minus c squared and the reason it's minus because on this um, channel i always use the metric minus one plus 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 so i use an overall positive metric um, with the zero component having a negative being negative. Other textbooks, other sources will also use the opposite metric where you have um, uh, plus, minus, minus, minus. Okay, so now our form is to find, our aim is to find the form of the equations of the t dot r dot theta and phi dot coordinates, okay, which gives us the four velocity of the particle and we can also use to get the four momentum as you'll see when we go on. All right, so a rotating source mass creates a space time around that. The metric, the Kerr metric, this is the line element, but within it is the metric. But anyway, the, it's often called the metric, but it's actually the line element. So the ds squared is this object here. So it's the line element or space time interval. It's this object here. Now the Kerr geometry is not spherically symmetric like the Schwarzschild case. Due to the frame dragging effect and the dilation in the equatorial plane due to rotation. So in the Schwarzschild case, we had a spherical shape. This one is oblate spheroidal because of the rotation. So it bulges in the direction of the equatorial plane. Okay, it dilates away from the rotation axis. So for those two reasons there, you have um, a geometry that's not spherically symmetric. 
<clears throat> now that has some implications. So that means that purely radial paths for test particles are not possible, meaning that the total angular momentum of these particles is not conserved. So in this Rossville case, we could have particles that came in on purely radial trajectories uh, because this was a sphere, it was symmetrical in all ways. It also meant that in this Rossville case, you could have motion confined to a single plane um, and that plane could be rotated about the center of the sphere there in any way you liked. Um, the high degree of um, spherical symmetry meant that uh, radial paths are, are possible, but in this case, we don't have spherical symmetry. You have, for start, the source mass is not a sphere. It bulges in uh, in the equatorial plane, so it's it's dilated away from the uh, flattened in a direction away from the rotation axis. Um, and uh, you have the frame dragging effect also, which means that um, angular momentum cannot be conserved. The total angular momentum cannot be conserved and no purely radial paths are possible, okay? We'll just come back to that, we'll pursue that a little bit more. So no particle can travel on a purely radial path due to the dragging of the inertial frames effect, and so the particle's trajectory is affected such that its angular velocity is its uh, phi component momentum, form momentum over its time component, or GT phi on GTT, is equal to the angular velocity, which is a function of r and theta, all right? So a particle of mass m must, as it moves in towards the source, rotating source mass, it must rotate with the source mass. Now all of that, this equation here is all part of the Kerr metric um, video series, so please go have a look at that. Um, but I'm just quoting that result from here to show you that with the frame dragging, any particle coming in must in, rotate as it moves towards the source, must rotate with the source, and uh, okay, must co-rotate with the source. You can't rotate against it. And so that twists paths out of the purely radial uh, into other other directions. So a free particle travels along geodesics, just reminding everyone of that, free particle. Now, by fixing r and theta, notice the angular uh, velocity here, uh, can be held constant if r and theta are fixed. Um, can have, now, by fixing r and theta, the free particle can have constant angular momentum by moving along some geodesic in the phi direction. So as long as it's moving in the phi direction, okay, that's this way around, the anticlockwise way, as long as it's moving in the phi direction, it can have um, constant uh, angular momentum um, for that component. All right, so I'll just build on that shortly. We'll just come here. I'll deal with that in a minute. But the Kerr geometry is stationary and axisymmetric. So a stationary space time is one for which all the components of the metric G mu nu are independent of T. This means the space time outside the mass does not change over time. So the partial derivative of the metric with respect to time component is zero. And that implies that in this direction, in the direction of the time coordinate, we have a killing vector K, which is KT ET, or uh, for, for physicists vector basis form here, or the differential operator for those with um, more of a differential geometry leaning, both meaning the same thing anyway. An axially symmetric space time is one for which the components of the metric G mu nu are independent of the angle involved, which in this case is phi. So this means the component of the angular momentum P phi in the direction of the rotation axis is conserved. So the space-time outside the mass does not change when moving in that phi direction, okay? So that component of angular momentum is conserved, but the total angular momentum also involves the theta component and the other uh, coordinates, and that's not conserved. But the purely uh, angular, uh, angular momentum component, P phi, is conserved. Okay, as long as you fix r and theta. So the partial derivative of the metric with respect to phi is zero. So there's another killing vector in the direction of the phi direction. So component k phi basis vector e phi or k phi and derivative operator, partial derivative operator uh, d phi. Okay. So we wish to find the equations of the geodesics followed by a free particle of mass m whose coordinates are given by x mu equals x mu of lambda. 
a parameter lambda for for a party with mass, best to use the proper time, but here I'm going to keep it general so that we can refer to photons and massless particles in general. Now, x mu of lambda is ct of lambda, r of lambda, theta of lambda, phi of lambda. So they're all parameterized in terms of this parameter lambda. Now, these geodesics of tangent vectors u mu is dx mu to lambda is x dot mu, so that's the notation being used. Now, for a free party, we can use the Euler Lagrange equations to derive the form of the geodesic for some Lagrangian, L is T minus B. And for a free particle, the Lagrangian is simply equal to the kinetic energy term. There's no potential. This, this um, particle has no net forces acting on it. So it's, it's um, not acting within any potential. There's no net forces on this, so it's a free particle. In the Newtonian case, a free particle just continues moving in a straight line, remains at rest, or moves at a constant speed, a constant velocity, okay, unless acted upon by some force. So if it has no net force acting on it, it'll remain at rest or in a state of constant motion. So our free particle here, Lagrangian, is just equal to the kinetic energy. Now, Lagrangian for our free particle is the form L as a function of x mu, x mu dot, and lambda. And it takes the form of half m g mu nu x dot mu x dot mu. Now the half there is for good reason. You'll see as we go along, it's actually necessary to be there. Some papers and textbooks put a two out front, um, uh, and uh, I have seen some cases where it's left out, but it is actually necessary. And you'll see why as we go along, it is necessary to have that form of half m g mu nu and so on okay so some some papers and textbooks just put a two out front but i'll just leave the half in front it's a familiar form we're used to so our lagrangian then if we expand all this out becomes l is m on two times this that's the gtt term gt phi term the cross term um the r term the grr g theta theta and g phi phi term okay so written all out with these coordinates Okay, now the Euler-Lagrange equation given by the total derivative of d d lambda of, of this object here, which is the partial derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to the x dot uh, coordinate minus dl dx mu is zero, or the partial derivative of the Lagrangian with the x mu coordinate. Okay, so starting with the first coordinate, x zero is t, and so x dot of zero is t dot. Um, <clears throat> Just notice too with with the coordinates I use ct and ct dot. Uh, but I'm just uh, just here. Re I only want to refer. I'm just referring to time here. Uh, but you'll see the ct dot will appear and so on. Okay, so d d lambda of d l d t dot minus d l d t is d d lambda m on two minus two times this. We took the partial derivative of the Lagrangian uh, with respect to t dot, and so we only have one t dot here now. So we've got c squared times t dot. Um, so that partial derivative, and then uh, there was another t dot where the cross term is was, and hence we've come out with this. Okay, now uh, the Lagrangian was not a function of t at all. Remember we talked about that at the beginning of the video, and so that term there is just zero. Uh, this is very nice now because we have d d lambda of this object here is equal to zero, and that suggests the first integral straight away. But before I do that. I'm just going to divide through by two, divide this whole thing left and right sides by two. So that cancels a two there. Okay, and I'm just left with GTT, C squared T dot minus GT phi, dividing through by two. Okay, it's equal to zero. And that tells us straight away there's a first integral. Okay, our first integral then, all of this is equal to a constant. Okay, so we um, integrating both sides uh, means the derivative here is gone. We're left with the original argument in here and it's equal to a constant. Now, I'm not wondering why it's a negative constant and I'll be getting to that shortly. Okay, now I can just summarize this a little bit more. This is GTT here, so I'll write that there. M on two times GTT, uh, CT dot, and then extra factor of C. And then over here, I've got plus gt phi times the m on 2 phi dot here and then an extra factor of c and for the moment i'm just going to call that minus e and that will become apparent shortly why that is 
be wondering what on earth is E. Let's go have a look. All right, now first we note that the covariant component momentum, PT, is MUT, so it's the covariant component UT, M on 2 GT2 UT, plus M on 2 GT5 U5, M on 2 GT2 CT dot, plus M on 2 GT5 Phi dot. Okay, great, so far we've got that, that expands out. Okay, now... If an observer with a fall velocity u encounters a particle with fall momentum p, then he or she measures the energy of that particle to be e is minus the fall momentum vector dotted or the inner product with or the scalar product dot product with the fall velocity u. Okay. So the observer has the fall velocity, they encounter at some point a particle with fall momentum p. Okay, and then that person will measure the energy e to be this. Okay, now the form momentum, the covariant form, minus E on C, PR, P theta, P phi. All right, so I'll just keep that's That's our vector. And what we're going to do now, an observer at rest far from the source mass will have a fall velocity, U mu. Okay, so a distant observer, sufficiently far, tending towards infinity if you want, but far from the source basically, will have a fall velocity. They'll have no spatial components, so that's zero, zero, zero. And the fourth velocity will just be C000. Now, so there's our fourth velocity here. Um, here's our four momentum components here. Well, when we take the scalar product of these two vectors or the inner product of these two vectors, what we're going to have, the only component that's going to show up is a time component at the beginning. That's the minus E on C. We already have a minus sign for that. So we have minus. Uh, PT, okay, uh, minus, and then PT is minus E on C, so there's two negatives there, they cancel, times this C factor here, we get E, which is just the energy, so what we found is the energy, okay, so this is the, uh, this E is the total energy of the particle, and it'll be conserved along the geodesic followed by the particle, okay, because that deals with a time component, there's a killing vector in the time direction. So energy will be conserved throughout the, all along the geodesic. So PT, the covariant component of the momentum, the covariant T component of the momentum, sorry, times C is this object here, which looks a bit familiar because that's what we found on the previous page. Okay, now these metric terms here are negative, negative, and so the left-hand side would be negative, and so it's necessary for this to be a minus E. That's why on the previous page, previous slide, sorry, we had a negative E here. Um, and by doing that, it, um, as you can see, it works out up here because energy should be a positive quantity. And so to do that, we need to make this a negative constant from, from the previous slide, it must be, because if you look over here, that's negative, GTT, GT phi, the cross term is negative. So the whole left-hand side of this is negative and we just left it equal to a, a plus E, that wouldn't make sense. That'd be suggesting that the energy is a negative quantity, which it can't be. Right. And that's why I'm remaking this video, actually, because it's a remake of the previous, I'm replacing the old one. All right, now for the fourth coordinate, X theta is phi, so X dot, uh, three, X dot three, sorry, the third coordinate is phi dot. And d d lambda d l d phi dot minus d l d phi l the Lagrangian is d d lambda, and d l d phi dot is this object here. I can't show you Lagrangian at the moment it's on the previous slide, but um, we go in here. This was a cross term. There was a, a phi dot here. We've differentiated with respect to that, so that's gone. And over here there was a phi dot squared. Hence the two has come out here. Okay. Now, the Lagrangian was not a function of phi on its own, so that term is zero on the end here, and all that's equal to zero. Now, what we have here is dd lambda of this in the brackets here, in the parentheses, is equal to zero. Now, what I'm going to do is divide through again by two to get rid of this factor here, which came from the differentiation up here, and the four there. So when I do that, I get this, which is the cross term gt phi. G phi t, and this two here disappears, so it becomes, this is the metric term G phi phi, 
okay and when we um our first integral of that is this object here equal to a constant and so we can now summarize this as m on two times g phi t times ct dot okay this one here is m on two g phi phi times phi dot so g phi phi here times phi dot and that's equal to a constant all right constant h now this component of the particle's form momentum is conserved along geodesics and there's another killing vector in the direction of the phi coordinate and so this is a conserved quantity along the geodesic so a particle following along the geodesic but only this component of form momentum is conserved the total form momentum involves the other angular coordinate and the variables uh, um, t and r and that is not conserved the total angular momentum is not conserved remember there are no purely radial paths in there this particle's uh, form momentum will change uh, angular momentum sorry this particle's angular momentum will change due to the um, inertial frame dragging effect okay so p phi is m u phi m on 2 g phi t u t plus m on 2 g phi phi u phi um, the metric here you can see these terms tt sums out and we're left with u phi um phi and a phi here sum out and we're left with u phi lowered okay so pm u phi now you see why the halves were necessary for the lagrange in the beginning it was necessary to put in the halves there this makes sense m on 2 g phi t c t dot so on is equal to constant h this component of angular momentum this component is conserved along geodesics okay so we have two equations now here they are All right. now we can write this in matrix form because the next thing we'd like to do is why not solve for ct dot and phi dot the coordinates the first derivative of those coordinates to help us find the four velocity okay so we can express ct dot and phi dot in terms of e and h and the metric terms so let's write out the matrix here ct dot phi dot um, and i'm just going to compactify that into a single object a11 a12 a21 and a22 times that that's the metric uh, that's the matrix sorry matrix sorry that's the matrix times the vector ct dot phi dot is minus e h okay where the solutions have the form ct dot phi dot is m inverse the inverse of this matrix here uh, multiplied with this vector minus e h now the determinant of m here the determinant of this is a11 times a22 minus a12 a21 okay and when we do that using these terms here we'll have m on 2 all squared times a factor of c and we will have uh, this object here now we've seen this object before part of it anyway now the inverse m inverse is one on the determinant times the adjoint of m and so one on the determinant is this and the adjoint is this simply uh, swapping these two terms along the diagonal and then the negative of these two all right so but filling all that out let's substitute in um, when we do all that put all these terms in when we do that we get this four on cm squared um, and then the half there we can divide or we'll multiply through by four get rid of that we'll just have two a factor of two out front and then these objects here okay factors of c and c here and cm here uh, the m2 cancel this uh, one of the m's down here so the solutions are ct dot phi dot is m inverse minus e h this object here times this and uh writing them out line by line ct dot will be this object times that first row here we go and phi dot will be this object here times the second row give us this All right, next step now just note that 
from a previous video on the inverse metric for the Kerr geometry in the metric in the Kerr metric series. We found this object hit before to be this, and delta, of course, is this. And so we can rewrite this as in this form here, which will just be handy in the next video and so on. So writing out our solutions in full, we get CT dot is this object here, which is this. Okay, because that 2 on cm, all of this here just becomes minus 2 on cm delta sine squared theta. And then we'll just multiply 3 by sine squared theta. So that'll simplify that a bit more. We'll have minus 2 on cm delta times that. And then phi dot, writing that out. Okay, minus 2 on cm delta sine squared theta. All of that there. Okay, and then um, again, uh, we'll just leave that one as is actually. There's full stop, leave it there. Now, so far we have found the following components of the tangent vector to a generalized geodesic, where u mu is dx mu d lambda is ct dot, and then we've yet to find these two, which we'll do in the next video, and phi dot. So we've got these two, the, the zero term and the third one, or first and fourth. And then the next video, we'll find the form of the equations of motion for the other two coordinates, r dot, theta dot. And they will be a bit more involved.